this afternoon, which is around rehabilitation and reducing recidivism. I hope I've said that right. Um, so um, briefly, the second panel will focus on appropriate rehabilitation of offenders. Certain issues that will be discussed are conditions in prisons, overcrowding and the treatment of offenders. And the prison population in England and Wales was projected to rise to more than 100, sorry, is projected to rise to more than 106,000 by 2027. The judicial system seemed to be actually bringing more people into it rather than keeping or sending them out. Um, and as such, the conditions in the prisons when poorly maintained become a disincentive towards ensuring offenders become Currently integrated into the economy. Uh, beyond prisons, this panel on rehabilitation will also look to focus on not just those coming out of prison, but also on those setting community-based sentences to widen the scope of the panel. Um, looking to non-custodial sentences in this way helps us expand a conversation on rehabilitation and make it more inclusive to include a breadth of persons who have entered and interacted with the panel system. So we have two guest speakers this afternoon. We're joined by Dr. Joe Easton, who is the Director of Policy and Advocacy at Unlock. And we're also um, joined again by Rihanna Taylor, who is the CEO at Circles. Um, so um, thank you very much, both of you, for joining us this afternoon. Um, Joe, would you like to go first? You've got around uh, five minutes or so, and then we'll hear from Rihanna, and then we'll we'll go on to take some, some questions. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I'm here on behalf of Unlock, which is a specialist organisation that supports people with criminal records via a helpline. But we also um, do influencing work to kind of challenge the system where it's not working. And I think uh, for this particular session, uh, the main point I'd like to make is that criminal records should be part of any conversation when you're talking about rehabilitation, because the criminal, having a criminal record and the system governs it um, puts barriers up for people um, in respect of getting a job, getting a house, um, getting accepted onto an educational course. Um, and so often ha having a criminal record can counter some of the rehabilitative support or services out there. And people might not even realise it because often the barriers are unseen. Criminal records um, can last way beyond someone's completed sentence, uh, can have lifelong impacts. Um, so you have rehabilitation periods and then um, filtering periods after you've completed a sentence. So often it's not seen as part of the criminal record system. It's kind of an add on, it's certainly not really referenced as part of the punishment that someone might receive. But it, it is a punishment um, in many ways, because I say having a criminal record and having to disclose it does lead uh, to all sorts of um, barriers, especially when you're looking at employment and housing. Uh, if you're looking at the particular cohort of people leaving prison, we know how important um, access to those things are to support people um, back in the community. Um, and so it's really important to understand that you can do a lot of really great way, work getting people into interviews and things like that. But if that employer has really poor policies around criminal records, people can be rejected um, straight away. Um, another, I think, key aspect for this particular inquiry is intersectionality um, of having a criminal record with other um, particular needs. So we all know about the disproportionality in the criminal record in the criminal justice system, which by definition leads to disproportionality in the criminal record system. If you get a more punitive sentence, then you have a criminal record that uh, is going to last for longer. You're going to have to disclose details of it for longer. And we know that there are a lot of minoritized groups that have disproportionately long sentences. Um, but also there are other, other things that can interact as well um, with things like getting a job and, and having a criminal record. Uh, just one example would be if we look at people with childhood offenses. Um, and we know, I think, as Rihanna mentioned earlier, that um, children caught up in the system often have um disproportionately from children who've experienced care or from other uh, minoritized communities like the gypsy roma traveler community and we know that um getting caught up in the justice system is linked to poor educational outcomes so when someone is then maybe leaving prison um and they're trying to apply for a job you're going to have um problems because you haven't got educational attainment that might be required for certain jobs, in addition to challenges with criminal records. Um, so there's a lot of intersectionality that I think 
um, is really important to remember. Again, if you're doing positive work um, for certain groups and a lot of employers and educational institutions do a lot um, to try and increase diversity and inclusion, and they might target underrepresented groups. But what they might not realize is that by having really restricted criminal record policies, that they're kind of putting one hand behind their back and tying one hand behind their back when they're doing that. So they might be uh, proactively seeking, for example, um, people from minoritized groups like Gypsy Roma traveler communities. But if they're then got restricted criminal record policies, those people are going to be excluded um, kind of right out the door. Um, so it's kind of counter to that. Um, I think in terms of um, what the solution is, uh, I think big picture, um, we really need legislative reform. Um, the criminal record system, which governs what you have to disclose and when you have to disclose it, is incredibly complex. It's incredibly hard to navigate uh, for even people like me who work on it all the time. Um, but for individuals or support agencies or employers to navigate, it is really hard. So a lot of the poor practice we see or poor outcomes isn't even intentional. It's just people not understanding um, what the system requires or what they're actually legally allowed to do. Uh, so it needs to be a lot more coherent, consistent um, and fair to make sure that it's being um, effective, which is meant to be supporting rehabilitation while managing any any risks that might be entailed with certain offences. Um, we also think that um, on a slightly lower level, I think there should be a lot uh, better practice and policy amongst employers, housing associations, further education institutions. Um, the criminal record system leaves quite a lot of discretion. There's very few examples where, for example, an employer is required to ask about someone's criminal record. It's only very limited regulated um, jobs. Um, the rest of the time they're allowed to ask about unspent convictions, but they don't have to. So there's huge discretion there um, and therefore potential for huge disparity of practice, but also potential for everyone to move in a really positive direction without the legislative re reform. Um, so I think having a greater understanding of um, what the system is by anyone who's in control of getting people into work or getting people um, settled accommodation um, is really helpful. Um, and I think that covers as well anyone who's offering rehabilitative services. If you're um, trying to support someone, um, get their life back on track, you need to understand how a criminal record system is going to impact on that. Um, and so we have a specialist helpline. We can help advise people to the complexities, um, making sure people are giving them information but not over disclosing. And we can also help people with how to disclose. One thing that we see, especially with people leaving prisons, is a lot of the support they've given is about being very honest about their their past um, and kind of being very honest about how they've turned their life around and all the positive changes they've made. Um, but something that, that we see when you're doing that is that you're basically putting people onto a really difficult track. Everyone else going for a job is going to be putting their best foot forward. They're going to be giving the best information about themselves. They're not going to be talking about the worst, the worst part in their life. And yet a lot of people coming out of prison, the advice they're given is you have to, you have to lay it all out there. You have to say all your deepest, darkest secrets and then say how you've recovered from it. Um, but that even uh, disallowing for discrimination um, around having a criminal record, you know, that, that puts you at a huge disadvantage. We get asked when we talk about disclosure, well, if I don't disclose my criminal record, someone said the other day, well, when would I disclose my mental health condition? And our advice, of course, you wouldn't. And normally you wouldn't expect, you wouldn't go into a job application wanting to disclose kind of the, the things that are most limiting um, or the, your, the worst periods of your life, but that's what people are often encouraged to do. Um, and also just quickly, because Ben had mentioned when I talked to him earlier about the, if I had anything to say about the prevention session. So I'd just like to take advantage of the opportunity here and just say that although what we do is criminal records, so it's um, post-conviction or receiving cautions, I would just like to flag that it is really important when you're looking at prevention that it really is prevention. And when you're talking about diversion, it really is diversion. Um, I think it was Tom who right at the beginning talked about 
diversion meaning you don't have a criminal record and that is really key because sometimes you see diversion that it is it is diversion and it pushes you towards support but you still end up with a criminal record or you still end up with a kind of sort of Damocles hanging over your head that if you don't do this you will get severe punishments um and I think that's there's a real kind of lack of clarity there which is concerning um and for example when we're talking about police going into schools um in kind of support roles there is a risk there that if police have information on their system that can be disclosed for elevated checks and we've seen some really sad cases where information that was was meant to be in a supportive way so engagement with police because children was subject um they were victims or at risk of certain behaviors that information is then shared as part of their criminal record because it happens to be on the police file and there wasn't enough checks about it so i think that is something that when we're looking at prevention we need to be really clear especially when the police are getting um more roles and responsibility in that preventive work that it's not um it's not creating a kind of a real difficulty for them in terms of um interacting with their role in terms of um detecting and um investigating crime thank you very much indeed joe that was that was really interesting and and as with our previous session there'll be an opportunity for our commissions to ask questions shortly so um thank you and um, may we welcome rihanna once again i hope i'm not overstaying my welcome yesterday absolutely <laughs> not no no absolutely not rihanna. Um, we'd, <laughs> yeah we'd, so. we'd, we'd, love, we'd love to hear more from you around this specific area thank you Thank you, Paula. And uh, just to a comment from me about, you know, just to say, Joe, we we refer a lot of people who call Circles UK to unlock and just what a wonderful advice service and 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 you know that you offer. So I just wanted to to mention that as well. Um, I mean, for me, and there was just a few thoughts I want to share, you know, and again, I will link in quite a bit with what Joe has said. I think uh, a lot of that is incredibly relevant. Um, but for me, so I'm going to try and cut out that 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 is, so that there's not too much overlap. But for me, one of the key things that I think is really important is to 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 do early intervention as early as possible. You know, if we want to really affect uh, rehabilitation and change in people's behaviour. And again, um, you know, that's where we it's linking to our first se session that we're not very good at prevention. We wait until there's a major problem and then we throw money at it and the kitchen sink at it, isn't it? Whereas if we intervene earlier, it is much simpler to solve problems at that stage with younger people, with people who have not uh, got entrenched, um, you know, negative behavior patterns, etc. I mean, just one example, um, at the moment, you know, we work a lot with online sexual abuse because that is just exploding as you know um and at the moment the police arrest about a thousand people a month uh for that uh only about 80 percent um yet about 20 percent receive uh a, 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 a guilty verdict and and you know or actually go to prison the rest um I ask the question, what happens to them, you know, whereas if we could do something with that 80% at that stage, because all they do then is they view, and by all, I'm not saying it's not serious and it doesn't do harm, but they view illegal images at that stage. They're not actually making contact with a child physically and engaging in, you know, contact sexual violence. So if you intervene at that stage, it would be so much easier to turn that peer person's life around, you know, because very often that is also a symptom of something else going on in their life, you know. And again, also, if we just look at young people, the vast majority of young people who sexually harm other young people are young people. So um, we think adults, uh, you know, are the ones who, who, who uh, most harm young people sexually. It's actually sexual harm amongst young people that is the biggest problem and again we talked a little bit neil talked about social workers in school etc that is where we should intervene isn't it at that age when people are teenagers when they actually make mistakes in their lives because they don't know better and that is where we need to put our efforts i think that is so important I think um, a second aspect that I would like to stress is that, again, specific to the UK, we have very few perpetrator rehabilitation programs. Um, I mean, 
you know, there's a few being run in probation, there's a few accredited programs in prisons, but because of the state of our prisons, most people don't get into those programs now. Some of them are, you know, some of those programs, you know, haven't been very well evaluated. We don't even know if they work really well. And then if you're in a prison and you're locked up for 23 hours a day and you can't get into those programs, what is the point? But in terms of other programs, there is this big divide, and again, specific to sexual abuse. We have these two poles between victims and survivors and perpetrators on the other end. And we treat it as an either or, whereas it should be an and and. We need to give more resources for survivors um, of crime, but we also need to have those rehabilitation programs, those treatment programs to help people stop their abusive behavior. It is really, really important. And that's not only for sexual abuse, it's also for other violent uh, offenses, et cetera. You know, really important. I want to make a strong plea for having more perpetrator programs available. Um, the problem is, if you look at the UK, we're a handful of organizations running programs for people with convictions for sexual offenses, two or three, four, five organizations. We all struggle financially because there's just no investment in that. So really important to look at that. And again, you can, we believe people can change. We've got the evidence of that. We've seen that invest in that and you know you will see a huge difference i mean just stopping one person from abusing a child can stop so many other victims and survivors you know and again it's in, you 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 cannot calculate that in just monetary terms it is all the the human suffering and the human trauma that is created through all of that um i think in just a very obvious one that we've touched upon a little bit in the first session is we need to create a functioning criminal justice system. Um, I don't need to tell any of you what's going on. Every aspect of the criminal justice system from arrest through to conviction, through to, you know, the court services, every aspect of it is just creaking, um, you know. And again, we used to be, I mean, when I first came to the UK, you probably heard from my accent that I'm from further afield originally. When I first came to the UK, I came from Africa, I was blown over by how amazing the criminal justice system in this country was. And I used to say to people, if only I can take some bits of this back to where I came from. Now I feel quite ashamed for what we have done. It is the saddest, saddest thing how we've destroyed what we were world leading on truly, truly. So that is something that I think really needs to be in the rehabilitation space. And yeah, I think I my last thought would just be also linked to perpetrator programs. We need to move away from one size fits all. You know, we do need individual programs. Every person is individual. You know, this there's been a, a trend in the Ministry of Justice to roll out, let um, you know, put out contracts for a very high volume. Um interventions that are very short i we have no idea whether those work or not you know i i know the organizations who deliver them really do their best but it is a one size fit all you put every person through exactly the same intervention it's often a modular program which says session 1 you talk about this session 2 you do talk about that that doesn't work with the kind of complex individuals that we deal with it doesn't work for women it doesn't work for you know name it um just in terms of my own um, organization and I don't want to you know spend too much time promoting us that's not the purpose of the session but each and every circle is a unique and individually led program and that is why they are so successful we don't have a script. We train our volunteers incredibly well that they actually are able to. When a person comes in in the morning and, uh, you know, they may have wanted to talk to him that day about, you know, his drug misuse. But if he comes in in the morning and he says, this morning I had an argument with my mother. She's kicked me out. Now I'm homeless. Then you're not going to say, well, hang on. Today we're talking about your drug misuse. 
you're going to shift and say, well, how can we support you with this problem? And that is where, you know, our programs need to be much more proactive and much more individually based. So I think I've said way too much. I'll shut up now. Thank you, Rihanna. That was once again really powerful. And just before I bring our commissioners in this afternoon, I just wonder how we measure and then prove the value of early intervention when we almost undeniably have a society that sees the cost of everything but the value of nothing. So, you know, does, does that ring true? And, and so how, you know, moving forward, how, how do we, like say, how, how do we, how do we prove that early intervention is, is, is worth, is worth sort of pursuing? Um, I don't have an answer to that question, but I think that, I think part of that is moving the conversation away from kind of financial costs. I mean, there's, you know, huge yeah. costs to crime that are in, to the victims, to their families, to the community, to lack of trust. So it's not just cost in terms of um, the kind of criminal justice system, um, but there are a much wider costs, which I think. It's not always monetary, yeah. 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 Um, I also think that, I mean, everyone who works in the system knows that prison is how expensive prison is. Um, and then if we put the same kind of money into uh, community services, um, that that would have a real impact. I think the challenge is, and you see it with any diversion programs, um, that where you've got lack of resource into community services, so mental health is a great example. Uh, kind of everyone probably has family or friends who have tried to access uh, mental health services at some point in the last few years and found it how difficult it is. So I think then it becomes really challenging to put in bespoke services for people who are in the criminal justice system because people say, well, my friend can't access, you know, maybe they should go and, you know, steal something. And that's how they get, you know, onto the, the services. So I think, I think it can be really challenging, but if you're talking early intervention, then you're putting that you're not putting the services in place for people who have already got into the justice system. You're putting it in place for everyone in the community who might be at risk um, of kind of, you know, who has the most complex needs. So it doesn't have to be a kind of all or nothing that you just put the services for people who are at risk of going into the criminal justice system. It could just people that generally who are most at, at risk for with the most complex needs. And I suppose that goes back to what one of the things that Tom was describing this morning about having that mandatory uh, pastoral care in schools, which was obviously, you know, early intervention in, in that in that respect, which would be there for, for every school and therefore every student. OK, um, Anita, I can see that you've got your hand up. Would you, would you like to come in there? Please? Yeah, Thank um, you. just a little bit on the question, the issues that you were just talking about. I think it's about bolstering social policy areas more generally, not just thinking about the school as the start point. It's a whole range of things that sort of all come together. And it's about, I'm always really frustrated that we have a, crim a system where the criminal justice system seems to be the panacea to all our ills. It's everything that goes wrong. They are seen to pick up the pieces, just as Joe's described. It's not just about mental health. It's about everything. It just feels like, oh, you know, that's the way we deal with it. And there we, rather than thinking more creatively. So, I mean, to go back to Rihanna's point about Scandinavia and Finland, for example, the prison is a site of punishment, which is why they can have such short sentences. Anything else gets done by social policy, social welfare providers. And so it's about a mindset. It's about how we think about criminal justice, I think, and about where we place it in our way of dealing with society and its needs. So I think it, I think that's a real challenge to actually think about criminal justice and how we have that ability to change mindsets. And I think that also speaks to both what Joe and Rihanna were think, saying about working with people who have experienced the criminal justice system. So here's my question. I wonder if, if uh, Rihanna, you could talk about the circles model and the way it develops community support and how or if this approach could have 
roll out it for other groups within the criminal justice system as it now exists. Because I also think what you're doing is speaking to that first point I made about you're actually building preventive a community building approach because it's the education education of those people within the community about people who are seen as others or difficult or however you know communities more broadly describe that cohort who come to your services but i just wonder if there's broader application and what its potential is beyond what you're doing yeah um, I just just want to, you know, just very quickly to say how a circle work, you know, in, in case people aren't 100% sure. Um, basically, a circle is a four to six volunteers that we recruit from the community who meet with the first person who has committed a sexual crime or has harmed someone else sexually. Uh, and that forms the circle. And then they have the volunteers are um, overseen by a coordinator who's a paid employee by the provider organization. And all the organizations that provide circles are charities at the moment. We don't exclude uh, private sector organizations, et cetera. But at the moment, they are all charities, really, because they, their value system, et cetera, sits best with that. And then what is really important, I think what Aneta may be thinking about, is we have what is called an outer circle. And that outer circle consists of statutory agencies. That would be your social worker, Neil, that you were thinking about. That could be a therapist. That could be, that would be a, the police representative. It would be a probation representative. It could be a local authority a housing uh, associate, you know, who forms part of the outer circle. And they regularly communicate with the inner circle circle to monitor the progress of the person and to kind of be, they are able to step in and intervene when there's an issue or you know the risk of another person being harmed and then they can immediately take action and I think what is important here which I think Anita is mentioning is that it's basically a three-way partnership you have the community who is represented by the volunteers and what is so phenomenal is that they do this work without getting paid um you know they now imagine we have about 650 volunteers turning up every day, supporting some of the most reviled people in our society, uh, and they're doing it without getting paid. And it's deliberately designed in that way because that is part of the restorative practice that we bring communities taking ownership of the problem, but also teaching that person, by well, hang on, there's a community who cares about you and actually help you access services and actually hold your hand when you sign up for the GP and take you to a movie to just let you have a normal life, you know. And then the second part of the partnership is the statutory agencies, government agencies, and then the charity sector, who is the people who, who run circles. So I think that is a very interesting model. And certainly, and it's every component has been del deliberately designed to fulfill that role. And I agree with Anita. I think we can learn a lot of lessons from that model because I can see that working in schools, you know, in a kind of peer support kind of model, um, in broader in communities. Because again, you know, we sometimes we just see the big problems, uh, the big mental health issues, the big health issues, the big crime problems. The majority of people, thankfully, have relatively small problems that you can solve with quite low key interventions that need not cost a lot of money. And we see it in our work. We work with some of the higher, highest risk people in society. They go to prison on average for between eight and nine years. Then they get released into the community. Now, if a volunteer can successfully work with that kind of person, it tells you that very often someone just needs to have a cup of tea with someone. They just need someone to say, how are you today? What's going on in your life? How can I help you? How can I extend a helping hand for you? We don't really always, it's about in 20% of problems that we need those really in-depth clinical interventions. The rest can be done by communities. And we have wonderful communities. We saw that during COVID, isn't it? How people rally together to help their neighbor, to help whoever, you know. So we have a huge resource there that we should tap into. And I know volunteering is more difficult at the moment because of the cost of living issues and all that. 
But that spirit is there, you know, if we could just go in there and say, come and help. We set up these groups, these community hubs, whatever we want to call them, and we identify the problems in that particular community and then, you know, work around that. Thanks, Rihanna. Jo, would you like to respond to, to that question as well? Um, and then yeah, I'll bring you in. Thank you. Completely agree with what Rihanna and Alicia were saying. Just to flag, though, that um, it is important that there are no barriers to, to that kind of peer support work. Um, it's something that we see, especially around uh, new probation contracts or if people are going into prisons, uh, they have to pass vetting and uh that that can be a, that they can mean that their criminal record is an instant uh, refusal, which obviously um, completely undermines the whole peer panel um, thing. And it is something that we have started to hear more of in the last year or so. That that um, pe people who have previously passed vetting are now being told they don't pass um, vetting, um, and I think it's it, it it's a miscommunication, a misunderstanding about criminal records checks being kind of synonymous with safeguarding when they're part of safeguarding they can be useful but they're not safeguarding so i think it's they're often used as a kind of a tick box and a yes or no which is not how they should be used and i just think peer support work is so important we need to make sure that there aren't any barriers to that and certainly small charities we've been hearing there are unfortunately a few barriers at the moment thank you joe um neil would you, would you like to ask a question I think the essence of Anita's uh, question is absolutely right, because if you look at um, prison populations across um, um, Europe, and indeed include the United States, because it's the it's the outrider, we are by far the uh, most likely country to imprison people. Um, you've said we might have 105,000 in prison um, uh, next year. Um, that's effectively doubled in about the last 20 years, 20, 30 years. Uh, you don't find those sort of trends in France, Germany or Italy or, or elsewhere. So the f my first observation is that we simply have to, as Anita has said, stop thinking that, or implied anyway, that stop thinking the prison is the first port of call uh, as a solution. Uh, we need to be uh, working outside prison uh, to... to um, help young people and i think rihanna's points that she's just made are exactly in line with that they you you talked about recidivism well it's a serious problem but if you send a young person to a prison the, the, the statistics are he is more likely to be um going back to prison than not going back to prison that is actually a statistical fact um and again that suggests that whilst we uh, send somebody to prison we do nothing to help them whilst they are in prison, um, and um, or very little anyway. Uh, so we do need to to look at that, um, and I think that involves my favourite topic, education. But it also involves making sure that prisons themselves um, are, are, are less brutal and more um, uh, places where people can uh, understand the problems that they've got themselves into and start thinking about solutions. So there's a new attitude. Uh, to imprisonment and also uh, the number of people we decide to imprison. What are your thoughts about those two questions, observations, I would say? Thank you. Who would like to go first? I don't think there's anything to um, to disagree with there. I think, um, I think certainly short-term prison sentences um, leave very little time for um, any engagement in education or um, rehabilitation, um, but have all of the most damaging impacts. People lose their home, their family, their job. Um, and I, so, I, and when I say when I'm talking about short-term prison sentences, I'm not just talking a couple of weeks, but I would be talking anything kind of probably under the kind of eighteen months um, kind of thing. I think has the the biggest damages and the the least positive um, impact. And I think that, that one of those things, and this is Anita touched on this, it's it's the mentality. And I think that. Once someone's kind of in prison, everything is looked, looked at through a risk, danger, harm angle, um, which makes it really difficult to actually look at what someone needs in terms of um, support, whether that's for rehabilitation or just for their own benefit. Um, so I think that it, the moment you go into that kind of part of the system, um, everything is looked at differently. It's why you have such high recall rates and things like that, that 
you know, rehabilitation is a is a journey, it's, and I think that if, when people immediately leave prison, it's the most difficult time, especially if they haven't got anywhere to live or a job or any support from their families. Um, and I think that because everything is seen as a risk um, and worrying about harm, the call rates are very high, and people aren't kind of held their hand isn't held along the journey as Raina was talking about, and the kind of um, support that is going to help people on that journey so um yeah i think it's a i think we need to we need to reduce our use of prison and i think there needs to be proper um proper language used around that and i think that um it stop, needs to stop becoming a political football um that it's kind of seen as who can be tougher and put more prison sentences in place um but we also need to do the diversion work so that um only we're only talking about the really minority of cases where uh, people might have to go to prison because nothing else has worked. Uh, Rihanna, would you like to add anything? I, I absolutely agree with everything that uh, Joe said and, you know, also Neil, I think. Um, just one thing I will quickly just throw in is, again, we've talked a little bit about um, Scandinavian countries, Europe, etc. Uh, Norway, I mean, they, for starters, they send very few people to prison. And secondly, those who then come out of prison, they are reducing their reoffending rate is incredibly low. If you look at it uh, proportionally in terms of comp comparisons to 100,000 of the population. And one of the things they do, which is a really interesting way of looking at it, and again, it says something for their society and their attitudes towards one another and their community attitudes, is that they guarantee every person who comes out of prison a house and a job. You, you know, when you come out, you have an address where you go to and you know you're going to have a job. And the community don't have a problem with it. Now, I do recognize that, you know, countries are different. I'm not trying to say we can just take Norway and dump it in the middle of the UK. Not at all. Um, but there is something that their communities see the sense of that. And it is because they've had these debates. They talk about it. They explain why is it sensible to give someone a house and a job? I mean, and that is the one uh, indisputable research piece of evidence we have is that if you want to stop reoffending, you give someone a job and you give them a house. You know, all the rest is still debatable, but not those two factors. And the Norwegians got it right. And they actually very seldom have to send someone back to prison, which is really, really interesting. And I would imagine the house and the job is probably just symptomatic of their community attitudes. They probably come with a much more open-minded attitude towards people who come out of prison than we do in the UK. Uh, so it's just I just wanted to add that, you know, it's an interesting model to look on. Thanks, Rihanna. That takes us nicely on to a question that was pre-submitted. Um, somebody wanted to know um, what strategies have proven most effective in providing stable housing and support for individuals exiting the criminal justice system. So I just wondered if you wanted to respond to that. I would say there has been a lot of positive engagement around employment um, over the last Yes, there's um, been a number of, of employers, including big employers, who started engaging um, yeah. with people leaving prison, um, which is great. And um, a lot of those employers that do do that kind of work, that they engage really positively with, with the prison itself. They go into the prisons, um, provide, they might provide training um, or assistance while people are preparing for release um, and then interviews so that people have jobs on release, um, which is great. Um, I know that, for example, Iceland has a great program. And I think one of the really good things about the Iceland program is that they um, it's a gradual process. So I think on, on release, people um, can only do a certain number of hours on their first couple of weeks. So mm -hmm. it's, it's there to make sure that it's not all or nothing and that you are supported as you go through. Um, a lot of the, mm -hmm. the um, employers... Timpsons and um, Max Bailman also offer similar. So they offer, for example, at Newhall Prison, which is a women's prison near Wakefield, um, Max Bailman have a essentially a shop within the prison, and they train women how to you know operate all the various machinery and and, and handle the money and all those sort of things. And then I think they 
they offer them a job on the living wage when 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 they're released from prison because you know there's something about are we setting people up to fail if when they leave prison or the prison system if we give them a, a, a train ticket and, and tell them to get on the way are we essentially kind of not necessarily encouraging but we're surely not discouraging them to to you know to re-enter the the, the the lives that the that they that they could you know they came from yeah you're, you're absolutely right and I think having um these places in already set up where before people are released so they have certainty um I mean the idea that you're being released and you don't know where you're going to live or yeah. what you're going to do um is terrifying as much as anything else um so I think there, there are a lot of very positive programs and I think there's been a lot of push towards that having employment leads and employment boards in uh, all the resettlement prisons um, I would say I think there are some limitations for that I think in general uh, quite a lot of employers have put limits on that so there are certain offence types they won't sure. touch um, and there might be certain cohorts that they um, kind of prefer so I think it, it's great that employers are doing that um, but I think it's always likely that they're going to kind of take the lowest hanging fruit and the people who are maybe most employable <laughs> is probably. Uh, so you do need to think about people who maybe are less employable um, and actually maybe need a little bit more um, support than that. Um, and just particularly just looking at the people going back to the, Sorry, just going back to the, the situation where somebody is uh, released from, from custody or from prison, is this where it's it's more important than ever that that the that the prisons become much more trauma informed and the staff you know undergo that trauma informed training because if you're potentially sending a woman back who's had terrible trauma in her life you know she may well have been she may have been trafficked she may have been in a, an abusive relationship she may have experienced some of those adverse childhood experiences that we referred to earlier you know by by releasing someone with with very little sort of guidance or support are we we are we we must be i'm sure the evidence would support the fact that 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 we would, would like i say we're setting ourselves up to fail essentially yeah i think that's absolutely right and i think it's um when you think of people who um, might have mental health issues, even if they have had support while they're in prison, especially if they're released to a, a new area, just not knowing the area. I mean, some of the best uh, support services that I've seen, and this is not just for people leaving prison, it's the same with people on community sentences, is I think, as Rihanna mentioned, it's, it's people um, going to someone's home and helping them get the bus until they know the route to the probation office or to their job um, because they, you know, it might you might get them a job and they might not turn up because they get lost and they panic and they don't know what bus it is and they don't know what to do. So it's, there's a lot of actually quite straightforward support that can be offered um, that can make a real difference. And there is also the issue of um, continuity of care and support and making sure that if someone has been identified as having a really significant background where they need trauma-informed support that that carries through into the community and they don't have to start the whole process all over again to find someone um, who's going to understand um, so if there is positive learnings done in prison we do need to make sure that that is um, carried through rather than um, having to start from the ground up again. Thank you. Anita I can see that you've got your hand up do you, do you want to come in there thank you. Yeah I think the point that sort of came out to me that I think we haven't touched on here is the importance of staff, staff across the board in terms of not just criminal justice, but social work, wherever, because there are real issues about staff training, staff retention, recruitment, people having the right skills. And I think we talk about a system, but it's about people. And it's about how people interact with each other. And staff, as well as communities, are a real part of this jigsaw. And I think we need to think about that in when we think about how the levelling up agenda and that where criminal justice fits in that needs to be, but we need to have that mindset because prison staff are recruited, but not retained. They get minimal training now, for example. So what does that say? What can we achieve? You know, again, setting ourselves up to fail in a different way. So I just think we need to have that sort of, and it isn't just about criminal justice staff. There are other staff in other parts of the system that need to be equally valued by our communities. 
Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Anita. Do we have any other commissioners that would like to um, pose a question? Thank you. And Neil, do you have any anything else you'd like to add? Uh, not really. I think we've covered the, covered the ground off here, but I do think we need to be, you know, seriously focused uh, on, on who, who goes to prison, what happens to them when they get there. And uh, as you've just been pointing out how they're treated when they get out. One would have obviously thought giving them um, a rail ticket is about the uh, least important thing to do. It's actually engaging them with the community, their families and friends and so on. And, and I think, oh, God, gosh, forgive me, it may have been Anita, Anita but um, who mentioned this, but it's something about ensuring that continuity of care continues. So when they leave prison, you know, do, 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 does their their GP, wherever they're going, know what medication they've been taking in prison, so they know what interventions have been, have been carried out. So, you know, th there isn't yeah. suddenly this sort of massive gap in, in, in treatment, which, which mm. could be so damaging. Mm. Absolutely. So um, I'm just going to refer back to the, the pre-submitted questions. We, we, we only have a little over five minutes. Um, but I wonder, the, there's a question around um, how can we better allocate resources to support rehabilitation efforts within the system whilst ensuring fiscal responsibility? That seems to be the, the phrase of the day the, uh, these days, doesn't it, around fiscal responsibility? Um, I wondered if, if um, uh, sorry, I wonder if um, Joe or Rihanna would, would like to comment on that. I, I think for me, it goes back to what we talked a little bit about in the first session, and that is, do we have, um, you know, clear crime prevention strategies? Or, you know, do we know what our priorities are? Do we know what the problem really looks like? And I think it's fairly easy to pull those things together because there are real experts, you know, around who have that information. They are fantastic researchers people like Anita, you know, a whole range of uh, um, amazing organizations who who collect all this information and know what should really be happening if they are given a chance. So I think there's a job to be done to have kind of like one or two overarching core strategies about what it is we want to achieve and then focusing on those. And I talked in the beginning about, you're not gonna do it in two years or three years. You need to have 20, 25 year strategies. You know, we just talked about staffing in organizations. You know, I, I heard this uh, this week that there's a probation officer at the moment carrying 280 high risk cases. Now that is inhumane and that is just dangerous, you know? so. Obviously, that must be a priority. How do we recruit and retain people in these core organizations where they are really needed uh, to restore public services? So I think that's the sort of thing that I'm talking about. We need that kind of, and it will be a long-term strategy. You're not going to solve it in, 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 in a quick fix kind of way. But also, once we are clear about those priorities, which is based on research evidence, we can then allocate proper funding to those priorities instead of trying to, you know, the scattergun approach. We're trying to, you know, hit everything and we're not very effective, actually. You know, what will really make a difference? Um, and that would be my input, you know, identify those, have long term strategies and then fund them properly. Um, I think I would say there's a couple of things. I think one of the first things is proper joined up thinking, making sure that if you are spending money somewhere, it is being effective. Um, one example that, that we come up against is that quite often people in prison are told that their best chance when they leave prison is to become self-employed. And they might even be given support around that, about setting up their own business and um, encouraging people what that business might be. And then they come out and they find insurance companies won't give them insurance because they have a criminal record. So I think it's making sure that if money is going in to support and services, that people understand that there aren't other barriers that are making that um, ineffective. Um, I think there's other things that it's making sure that if you can provide information or support in a way um, that is less expensive, for example, using in-cell technology, um, which I know there's a lot of uh, fear around the public perception about people in prison having access um, to kind of technology, but actually there's some support and services for some people that actually 
is is probably relatively easy to provide on a kind of mass basis because it's the same kind of information, the same kind of courses. And then you need to work out where does support need to be, as Rana said, there's some support that needs to be case specific. And that's obviously where the expense is. But there's some advice that isn't necessarily case specific, that actually everyone needs the same advice or support. Um, and if you can use technology to provide that, um, it, it really feels like we should be doing that and then diverting the in-person case-by-case support to where it's really needed. And as I said, that when you look at people leaving prison, there's are people who are maybe already more employable um, and already have better support systems in place. Um, and that's great. And existing services can pick them up. And then there are people with really complex needs and the, the support services just aren't going to be enough for them. Uh, so it's spending the money where you really need to and the people who need the most support, I think, is is probably a good way forward. Thank you, Joe. And that takes us really nicely to the conclusion of um, today's session. Um, can I ask if anybody has any final comments they'd like to make before we wrap up for today? No? OK, that, that's fine. Um, can I thank you all for attending and particularly um, to Joe and to Rihanna for your excellent presentations and contributions this afternoon. Uh, thank you to our commissioners and everybody else who attended this afternoon. And, and that concludes today's meeting. Thank you very much.